Hi everyone, my name is Ning Zhang. I'm currently an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. In this short video, I will provide an overview of the background knowledge for papers on the network management and security in SITCOM this year. For those of you who are new to network security, managing and securing the highly complex network we have are some of the biggest challenges for network operators and system administrators. From a user perspective, the complexity that ensure the reliable and secure operations of networks are often abstracted away. And as more and more aspects of our daily life start depending on network services, we have high expectation for the network. For example, when we're on the road, the cell phone is often used for navigation and should be always connected. When we are talking to friends and family using video conference, we have the expectation that the link is high bandwidth and low latency. And when we're using our mobile phone to deposit checks, we expect the communication is secure. And when we are using the, the, the mobile phone or computer to access iCloud photos, for example, uh, the communication is expected to be private. In reality, the network is diverse and complex. The simplified user view previously expanded here to show the real world complexity. For a mobile device to watch Netflix, the traffic need to go through a diverse set of equipments. The traffic need to go through cell tower, then to the transport network, then to the core network. There are also many protocols to support different operations along the way. And just to name a few, we have the widely used TCP IP and UDP, MME for mobile management, SNMP and RDMA, that's widely used in data center, and many other services in the network, such as NTP, BGP, DNS. In this section, two papers focus on the management of network. Now, securing this network is also challenging. For example, when the switch is compromised, it can poison the DNS cache response, and therefore it can redirect uh, user traffic to a malicious server. On the server side, uh, when a network function is compromised, it can be used to attack other co-located network functions using side channel, such as stealing sensitive information, such as cryptographic key and keystroke. Not to mention the powerful attacker who can compromise the core network, such as the government, uh, for censorship and surveillance. Now to protect the user from these attacks on the network, there are different security mechanisms developed along the way, for example, we have the widely used TLS and IPsec for transport security. We have um, PKI for uh, web of trust, and we have Tor and VPN for anonymized communication. The next two paper in this section focus on security where it analyzes the DNS security and the Tor network security. There are two sets of paper in this section, the management and security. From the network perspective, our first paper is a composition framework for change management coming from AT&T. And the second paper is Auric using data-driven recommendation to automatically generate cellular configuration. The first paper is on change management. So what is change management and why should we care about it? The first sentence of the paper is a quote from Winston Churchill. To improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. This sums up the motivation for this paper and why we need to have change management. New applications such as virtual reality, emergency service, and high definition video puts an increasing demand on our network asking for a bigger bandwidth, lower latency, and better reliability. This shift in demand on the network often entails software and hardware upgrades. And oftentimes we need to bring a new technology such as 5G and SDN into the network. 
Changing the, a complex network architecture is actually very challenging. First of all, we have the scale and complexity. There are, there are a large number of devices in the network. And then there's a risk of service impact where we want to make the change while minimizing uh, the impact on user experience. There's also diversity. There are many types of network equipment in the network. Um, just to give an example, in 4G networks, there are 27 different radio head types, 13 carrier types, and five downlink MIMO modes uh, for AT&T. And lastly, the, the network is constantly evolving, so this change is constant, just like the code states. There has been previous efforts trying to address this problem from SICOM 14, 16, and 19. To tackle the challenge of constant network change, in the first paper, A Composition Framework for Change Management, Mahimka and others proposed CoreNet, a dynamic composition framework that allows operation teams to maximize reuse of building blocks to quickly adapt to new change management goals, and it evolves on an ongoing basis. There are four key ideas in the design of CodeNet. The first one is modularization, which aims to establish a reusable library of building blocks. The second one is design composition, which automatically transforms in network change intent into network implementation. The third one is change plan optimization that translates the change plan into mathematical models and optimization solvers. The last one is verification. It's composition of change impact rules across multiple performance indicators and time intervals. Now, this is an interesting paper with lots of details on real world challenge of designing and deploying a change management system. I encourage you to attend their talk and read the paper for more details. The second paper in management is on cellular network configuration. So what is cellular network configuration and why should we care about it? There's a tremendous increase in the use of mobile device in the past several years and it's reflected in both mobile network traffic, as you can see in the diagram on the left, and the increased amount of carrier in order to meet the demand. To add a carrier, sometimes referred to as the radio, there's often new hardware to create the radio channel and also software configuration to integrate the carrier into the network. And any misconfiguration or suboptimal configuration parameter can increase the risk of poor quality of service and therefore resulting in financial loss for the channel addition. However, coming up with the proper configuration is very challenging. There are thousands of parameters. Just to name a few, there is user mobility, interference, load balancing, handovers, outage and congestion management, and there are also complex interaction among the parameters. Some of the configuration also need to be tuned according to the location characteristic as well as the proximity to other communication equipments. The existing state of art is a rulebook guided by domain knowledge, and this can sometimes be time consuming to generate. So in the second paper, Auric, using data-driven recommendation to automatically generate cellular configuration. Mahimka and others explored the possibility of using a data-driven method to automatically generate the cellular configuration for deployment. This is a very interesting paper with um, data from real world and experiences of interacting with the operation teams. So I would highly encourage you to attend the talk and read that paper for more details. Now, here comes the second set of papers on security and privacy. The first one is called Bento, Safely Bringing Network Function Virtualization to Tor. The second paper is an attack paper from IP to transport and beyond cross-layer attacks against applications. But what is Tor and why should we care about it? Tor is the most widely used anonymous communication network 
It protects vulnerable internet users such as political activists fearing surveillance and arrest, or ordinary web users seeking to circumvent censorships. To see how it works, imagine Alice wants to talk to Bob, uh, but she's either being uh, uh, censored by a government or uh, she doesn't want to be monitored by uh, a particular government. What she would do is obtain a list of Tor nodes uh, from the directory, then forward her requests in an encrypted manner uh, to one of the Tor nodes. The Tor nodes then randomly f relay the message within the Tor network and uh, eventually exit out of the Tor network and reach the server. This way, uh, Alice can circumvent the block IP addresses or uh, avoid the surveillance. Now, given the importance of Tor network, how do we improve the performance while preserving the privacy? As a matter of fact, about three years ago in Oakland, there was a paper that talks about anonymity trilemma, where it states between strong anonymity low latency and high bandwidth, one can only achieve two attributes. Now the key research question that's being asked by the first paper in security privacy set is, can we bring NFV to Tor to make the anonymity network more programmable, therefore empowering users to make precise set of trade-off they want and when they want to do it in a secure manner. In this paper, Michael and others from University of Maryland and Purdue proposed Bando, a novel architecture that augments Tor by allowing relays to act as user programmable middle boxes. While it improves the functionality of the network, the design has interesting implications on the threat model of Tor. Even though users and Tor relays do not trust each other, relays have to run different network functions provided by the users. And some of the users can be malicious. Therefore, it's challenging to protect both the relay nodes and all the users of the network. Now, to, the key idea to mediate this conflict is to bring in trusted execution environment and software sandboxing to NFV, where trusted execution environments such as Intel SGX protects the NF from the host system, and the sandbox protects the host from the network function that is controlled by the user. Now this is a very interesting paper that departs from the current state of, of art in uh, anonymity network. And I encourage you to attend their talk and read their paper for more details. This brings us to the last paper of the topic, an attack on DNS. But what is DNS and why should we care? DNS is one of the most important building blocks of modern internet. To see how it works, let's say Alice wants to watch a movie on Friday night and she type in her browser and say netflix.com. The first thing her computer needs to know is the IP address of netflix.com, therefore it goes to a DNS server and say, what's the IP? DNS replies 3.230.129.93. Then her computer knows which server to connect to in order to initiate the process. However, when an attacker comes along, he can poison the DNS response and redirect Alice's request to a malicious server. Now, modern days, uh, we mostly focus on the off-path attacks um, because they have the least expectation of the required attack power. And some of the latest development in recent security conferences include um, BGP hijacking, software side channel, and IP fragmentation. Now in this paper, the key question we want to answer is, how practical are these attacks? In the last paper in the section, From IP to Transport and Beyond Cross-Layer Attacks Against Applications, from Dai and others in from Humphrey SIT launched an internet scale evaluation of different off-path DNS cache poisoning attacks. And show for the first time, DNS cache poisoning can enable adversary to bypass cryptographic defenses. The paper has many interesting details and I encourage you to attend the talk and read the paper. 
With that, enjoy the conference and see you virtually.